How, I ask you, how many plants do we eat or use? How many plants on Earth in the biosphere do we use for the wood in our tables, for our food, our vegetables, and our cooking oils, and cleaning products, all that stuff? How many plants do we actually use? Well, recently, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, put out a new report, and like their previous reports, it is startling, but they have a very startling figure in that report. And uh, Robinson Meyer wrote about it in The Atlantic, and I just want to read you this quote. Quote, the freewheeling, far-reaching maw of our material metabolism, that thing we normally call the global economy, devours as many as one out of every three sugar molecules made by dirt-bound plants on net. That is astonishing. Uh, the, the fact that one out of every three plants is bound up in human activity in some way. When people say, well, we're so small on the face of the planet, how can we possibly be affecting it and the environment and the biosphere? One out of every three plants that you see, we are affecting in some way. If we're not eating it, we're using it. Oh, it's too much. Effects and effects like these have become so huge, we are now at the point where if we do not radically shift how we manage our carbon-based economy within our own lifetimes, we are going to see catastrophic changes to the climate, and some of those changes we're already seeing right now. So eat your vegetables, kids, and get big and strong, because this is gonna take all of us. I'm not depressed. Hello and welcome to another episode of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your best comments, corrections, and questions, and I address their dire consequences in great detail. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, we're gonna fight another scaly beast, one that doesn't exist, but I'm gonna tell you how to kill it. And we're not gonna be punching it to death like a turkey. That was a weird one. But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we are going through the day that we could have set the Earth on fire. I discussed a topic that was brought up in the 1940s when we were developing the world's first atomic weapons during the Manhattan Project, and when some of the smartest scientific minds in the world came together to consider the question of whether or not exploding a nuclear bomb in air would accidentally fuse all of Earth's air and lead to the complete destruction of the planet. We go through all of those calculations and considerations in the latest episode, which is pinned in the comments on YouTube if you want to watch it. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Tyler Newsom, and they say, great show. Thanks. However, how would the math change with an antimatter bomb instead of a regular nuclear bomb? Well, OG super nerd Matterbeam and I were talking about this on Twitter, and Matterbeam calculated that with 100% efficiency, which antimatter reacts with, you would need about 50 kilograms of antimatter, which is less than most of us weigh on average across the... Anyway, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of antimatter, does it? Well, the problem is that antimatter is incredibly hard to produce. I've seen figures where we can make just 10 milligrams. Remember that a paperclip weighs maybe about a gram. 10 milligrams for around $250 million, which puts the price on a world-ending super antimatter weapon at a little over a quadrillion dollars. We can't even pay for our colleges here in the United States, so a quadrillion dollar seems like it's not gonna... It's not gonna come from anywhere. And I think at the time, the Manhattan Project was the most expensive research project in history of that type. So to go even a little over $2 billion at the time in the 1940s, so to go a million times more expensive than that, literally, I don't think that's gonna happen. I wouldn't worry about it. To me! Perfect. Our next comment comes from Kim Schroeder, who says, maybe this is how the Death Star works without needing so much energy. Just let the planet's atoms do the job themselves. That's really interesting. So in the original paper that the scientists published, circulated amongst themselves, and then was declassified in the 1970s, they calculated how much energy this world-ending firebomb would take. And if you do the math based on how much energy it would take to separate the planet into chunks like the Death Star does with Alderaan, Aldergon more like it. Ah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That figure is around 10 to the 32 joules, while the energy for the world-ending bomb might be around 10 to the 20 joules. So if you divide those two figures, you see that there's a difference in 12 orders of magnitude, which means that it would be a trillion times easier, theoretically, to set the whole world on fire than to blow it up Death Star style. So if the Empire was smart, they'd just do that. <laughs> but 
they're not. They call them laser swords. <laughs> Iman Sykes says, I have to ask you something. It doesn't have anything to do with science, but more to do with your daily life. How are you dealing with the feeling of knowing lots of stuff about lots of stuff without having a clear capital vision uh, with what you want to do in life or what you want to be an expert in. I mean, don't you ever get the moment where you think that you waste a lot of time learning stuff instead of concentrated on one particular thing? <laughs> I think this answer might help a lot of the people, including me, watching your videos. I love the videos. Keep up the good work. Hey. Thanks. The odd thing with science communication is that I like knowing a little bit about a lot of stuff and not being an expert in anything. Actually, my expertise, I guess if you could call it that, would be in being a generalist, in being able to translate complicated and technical information for a lay audience. That's kind of like my own superpower, and I think that I'm fine at it. So I'm not really worried about not being an expert in any one particular thing. And if you are concerned about not being an expert in any particular thing, not knowing what you really want to do, my advice to you would be this, just to follow your passion. That's exactly what I'm doing. I, I'm following my passion. I love talking about these kinds of things, no matter if they have to do with biology or nuclear physics. I'm very passionate about it, if you couldn't tell. So I would say, follow your passion, and don't be so worried about fitting into one box or the other. You can make your own box and then exist inside it forever. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Alexander Rogers, who says, let's do some math. A 57 meter radius sphere at uh, 100 billion Kelvin? That sounds like a lot of heat output. Well, how much? Assuming it is a perfect radiator or black body, then the power output equals surface area times the Stefan Boltzmann constant times temperature to the power of four. Yes, the power of quattro. Plugging in some numbers, you get a power output of Whoa, six times 10 to the 40 watts or about a hundred trillion suns worth in a volume that could easily fit inside a stadium. Now that's a lot of energy and that's a lot of math, Alexander. And that's the kind of thing that I just give out super nerd status to like kids asking for trick or treat candy. Except in this case, I'm not hiding with the lights off so they can't tell I'm there. So I don't have to interact with anybody. Have you never done that? What? During Halloween, I would turn the lights off and close the blinds and act like I am not there. So I do not have to talk to anyone. Well, for doing all of that math and not hiding your answer away like a miserly Halloween candy giver, I think that's, I think that's one that we ended up on. You are indeed, Alexander, a super nerd. Ah! Oh. But of course, I'm not always right. I sit upon a lonely island of useless trivia amidst an ocean of ignorance. Sure. So what did I get wrong last week? Give me a second. I gotta get ready for this. I gotta pronounce words right. Our first correction and our biggest correction comes from a number of you who all say something like, you're German and I can't pronounce German words correctly. Uh, especially the word for breaking radiation, which I said, I think, bremsstrahlung in the episode. Let's go to the experts. Computer, how do I say breaking radiation in German? Bremstrahlung. 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 Good correction. Wow. And now I can perfectly say Bremstrahlung. Correctly. <laughs> They'll never know. Our next correction comes from Tiago Carvalho, uh, Graham Morris, Naris Free, and others who say, love the show, but seriously, how can you say that you're not a supervillain after this video, it's like telling the audience what you're gonna do uh, all along while we would just think, oh, hey, it's just a, another uh, Kyle's funny video. At least he didn't kill any superheroes this time. <laughs> Please don't target me, a fan from Brazil. Look, I, I, don't, I have no idea why in the last maybe few episodes of this show or the main episodes where you're thinking, I'm, I'm trying to bring about world domination or the end of the world or just eliminating all the superheroes. That's, that's ridiculous. And you know, given that so many of you are saying that, yeah. No, there's, there's a lot of them this time. I'm sorry, hello, how are you doing? Really? What did he say? He did not. Just talk to him. You're not made out of stone, just have a conversation. Yeah, no, anyway, it's like they, they're acting like this isn't just, you know, a bit that I improvise off the top of my head and then I'm a real super villain, it's crazy. That's a good idea. Laser bees. <laughs> yeah, we'll pollinate them. 
<laughs> Paula, eliminate them. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's fine. You, no, if you gotta go, you gotta go. Tell me what he says. Bye. Sorry, I was just hanging up on my university that wanted me to donate more money. Our next correction comes from Ocean Santa. What is Aquaman if not Ocean Santa? Who says, uh, you'd actually have to divide the number of nitrogen nuclei in your calculation of how much energy would be in a cup full of air, a hand cup, a hand cup full of air, since uh, only a pair of nitrogens result in a fusion. Well, that's actually, wait. Also, I love the videos, but please never try to say that word again. Come on! I told you, I fixed it. I'm perfect at saying Bramstrahlen. Now. <laughs> Ooh. Our next correction comes from Stefan, who says you get an A plus for pronouncing Bramstrahlen. In German. <sighs> Thanks, I'm really killing it. But the nerdiest correction of the time I'm filming this video, I'm giving to Abdur Rahman, who says, hey Kyle, love the show. Thanks. Uh, at 3.16 in the video, you say harmlessly as if a nuclear blast could dissipate itself harmlessly. I'm having a hard time believing that it would still cause a great deal of harm. I just wanted to mention that even though it wouldn't ignite the atmosphere, it would still superheat the surrounding air to thousands of degrees and would render the air for a long distance hot enough to cause wood, clothing, paper, and plastic to catch fire instantly. The area for the little boy bomb was around nine square kilometers, which caused massive damage to everything. Just to mention, the SAR bomb, the most powerful uh, detonated nuclear weapon, had heat spread over an area of eight thousand square kilometers. Yes, when I said harmlessly dissipate when talking about a nuclear weapon, I meant just having a normal nuclear blast, which would be terrible and can cause terrible levels of catastrophe. But relatively speaking, a normal nuclear blast is not as devastating as blowing up the entire world. But I do take your correction. It's important to know that these weapons are still incredibly destructive and we shouldn't take light of them. But in context, they're not lighting up the whole planet. So eh, I'm gonna give it to you. And for that, Abdur, you are indeed a super nerd. Do you wanna see it? I caught it. Now, moving right along, in this week's, ow, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are going to fight a dragon and win. Gosh, darn it. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we're returning to our kind of mini series on how to fight something. Usually, we fight something like a T-Rex or a Velociraptor, but this time, we're gonna try to fight a dragon, again, with the help of Dr. John R. Hutchinson. If you actually had to fight one of these mythical boys, how would you attack it? What would be the best possible way to ensure that you would end up victorious like ye olde knights of old? Redundant. We will be learning how to fight a dragon very soon, but until then, go check out the latest episode Because Science, if you haven't yet, all about the day we almost set the whole world on fire. And leave me your best and nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. And don't forget, if you didn't occasionally sweat the small stuff, you would die because you'd overheat because sweat is tiny water. We're just bags of gross.